So we can start by your introduction. Yeah. Okay, my name is Hans uh, Jonsson and uh, I am uh, currently a professor in occupational therapy and occupational science in uh, University of Southern Denmark in Odense. Uh, and I'm also associate professor at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. So uh, I was originally trained as an occupational therapist as early as 1977 I was examined and uh, I worked about 10 years in clinical setting and then I continued to education and research and uh, there I have been up till now in, in that part so uh, and uh, my passion for the moment is actually then to develop occupational science and also to connect it to occupational therapy mm -hmm. as I experience that it is of urgent importance mm -hmm. for, for, uh, for doing that. I mean, uh, when I met one of the founders of occupational science, Elisabeth Jerksa, I met her the first time 1989 and she then said that uh, occupational therapy is an applied science in search of a science to apply. And that really um, sort of struck me that this was actually what I was experiencing as an occupational therapist, that we did very good things for our clients uh, and had a unique perspective. But we did not have any concepts or actually systematized knowledge around what people's doing actually will uh, influence their development and their health in, in that part. And so from that moment I was uh, sort of uh, into occupational science and I also made my own dissertation around actually what happens in an occupational transition like retirement. Mm -hmm. So I studied the retirement process and uh, made some conclusions there around uh, the importance of occupation and also especially then the importance of engaging occupation, which was a concept that I developed from, from my research um, in retirement. And so uh, that have been my area of uh, interest mm -hmm. and I've been developed it uh, very much also in relation a little bit to older people, aging and what actually uh, engagement in occupations mean for uh, having a good life as an elderly person in that way and the importance of engaging occupation. Mm -hmm. um, in that part. So I think that that's uh, my area of research and also in relation to this I've been into uh, the concept of occupational balance which I think is also one of the key concepts to understand human occupation because it's very seldom that that an occupation stands along so to say. Mm -hmm. Uh, the important thing that is that this has a relation to the whole pattern of, of a human being and that this pattern has to be understood mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to actually be uh, uh, understand the mechanism of, of a human occupation. For example, I mean, if you take something that you call relaxation, like mm -hmm. watching a movie or something like that, that is relaxation, but the whole, the actual, the word relaxation says that you have to have something to relax from. Yes. That it's says something about the relationship mm -hmm. between occupation, because if you don't have anything to relax from, watching a movie would be something more like that you do because you don't have anything better to do mm -hmm. in, in that part. And then it's it's not relaxation, it's more that killing time mm -hmm. or, or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So importantly, we have to see also people's occupation within patterns in, in that part. So I've been interested in, in that and also 
bit in relation to flow theory, mm-hmm. which is a theory that I think is very powerful to to express what actually happens in, in human occupation when you got really engaged into something and uh, uh, sort of get lost in some mm-hmm. way within your occupation. It sort of catches you. There's many powerful expression about when you really are engaged in, in occupation, mm-hmm. you lose the sense of time and, and uh, things like that. So. That thing is is my interest within mm-hmm. occupational science, and I also uh, want to uh, connect this to the practice of occupational therapy, and uh, think that it it is uh, extremely important uh, around this uh, to uh, connect to that. Mm-hmm. And I do this in in education for the bachelor program, mm-hmm. for the master program, and actually also for the PhD. Uh, education and program. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I run courses on all these levels, mm-hmm. you can say. So you told me about uh, some concept and especially about the concept of occupational balance that is for you fundamental and you gave a kind of definition of, about what is occupational balance. Uh, in, for, in our network we would like to Okay. to create a definition, French definition of uh, different concepts. It's not always easy to choose which one or why this one, but uh, actually we are dealing with the concept of occupational balance, occupational engagement, and occupational justice. For the moment, uh, these are the three main uh, concepts we are we are building, we can say. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you explain me uh, about occupational balance and you tell me about occupational engagement. And of course about occupational transition, but for the moment (laughs) we are not at this step uh, in (laughs) French speaking area. It will come later. uh, Could you just uh, define a bit uh, what do you think about occupational engagement? Because, uh, I mean, Usually, when I read articles or when I discuss with practitioners, for them, occupational engagement is just the, you are engaging in occupation. Mm. They don't really consider what is occupational engagement. Mm. It's like it is natural to be engaged in occupation. Yeah, but uh, I understand that. And in, in my research, when I uh, research retirement, I mean, I came to the conclusion that the difference between a good life as being in retirement and a life that you were not satisfied with was the present or absent of engaging occupation. And by that I mean we engage in many occupation, but an occupation that are of special importance for you, I call that an engaging occupation. And that is something which sort of develop through time in, in that way. I mean, you do a lot of occupation. Mm-hmm. You do, you brush your teeth every day. That is for certain an occupation. But you don't consider that an engaging occupation. It's something that, that is a base of you, of course, important, because losing the possibility to brush your teeth will have consequences. But while you're brushing your teeth, you're thinking about more important occupations that you will do during your day in, in that way. So I think it is important to also make a sort of category of of occupations that is not connected to the areas like work or Mm -hmm. leisure but are connected to the qualities of the experiences because the engaging occupation is something that is needed to have I would say then a a good good life and to develop you know in, in doing around that of course, you need to have some, some basic occupations. Uh, they are necessary, but they are not uh, the quality of engaging in, in that part. You do them because mm-hmm. you have to do it, mm-hmm. and you, you realize that, that this is something necessary in your life in, mm-hmm. in that part. And uh, my thinking is that uh, 
when an occupational therapist see a client. I don't want to th them to think first, can this patient take a shower? Can they do this and this? I want them to think, can this have, does this person have an engaging occupation? And if so, uh, what other problems might there be in their occupational mm -hmm. patterns? And then, of course, you can come to the conclusion that the most important thing now is what I would call the basic occupation mm -hmm. in that part too maybe to, to be able to, to uh, go to the bathroom or, mm -hmm. or to take a shower or whatever. But I want people to actually see the qualities of people's occupation in the first place, to be able to address what I think is the most important for health and development within our professional focus then. It's like the, you are explaining what is for you the an occupation that could be an occupational perspective. Yeah, in definitely. Occupational yeah, yeah. I'm, when I, I I sort of written an article trying to formulate an occupational perspective and and mm -hmm. what would be in the focus uh, mm -hmm. for occupational therapists and occupational scientists also, of course. Um, so an occupational perspective means that the basic focus for us is actually that people uh, need engaging occupation, mm -hmm. uh, those type of occupations to, to live a good life. And, and mm -hmm. that is the occupational perspective we need to have as our professional, uh, professional mm -hmm. perspective in, in that part. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, yeah, I think that that's the, the thing I, I, I want to put forward mm -hmm. the, also in my research and, mm -hmm. and uh, within my theoretical thinking around occupational science. Mm -hmm. So if you can tell me about one example of research project you have led or maybe a clinical application mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. developed. Yeah, uh, I can tell you about the latest project that I've been involved in and, and still are involved in which is uh, uh, prevention project for elderly uh, with the risk of fall and fall mm -hmm. um, fall accidents you know you know that fall is a very big health issue within elderly people mm -hmm. and um, our thinking is that we formulated a preventive program uh, for actually healthy elderly uh, within the primary care uh, with the title active lifestyle all your life which means then that that people when they become elderly maybe a bit more frail mm -hmm. but with the right knowledge they can continue to live what we call an active lifestyle which means that they can continue to do the occupations that they value and mm -hmm. find meaningful so we formulated an intervention program with a base of occupational science um, assumptions and uh, conducted this with groups in, in primary care. Uh, and we also connected other disciplines, so it was like a multidisciplinary intervention, but on occupational science ground. Mm -hmm. So we connected physical therapists, we connected dietitians, we connected nurses uh, to this intervention to be able to address all of this from a broad mm -hmm. perspective in, in that part. And um, it was a group-based intervention, so it was like formulated like a study mm -hmm. groups where participants supported each other and uh, all those things. So uh, it's been scientifically ev evaluated uh, in a randomized controlled trial and uh, the intervention group made uh, progress. There were less falls, less mm -hmm. fall incidents, higher rate of actually participation f for the intervention group. So it was uh, quite a good result, mm -hmm. I would say, um, in that part. So this is an example of an occupational science-based mm -hmm. intervention that actually are 
targeted to healthy adults, but maybe adults that are in the risk zone mm-hmm. for actually uh, going, you know, into this spiral that maybe ends up in a nursing home or, or something like that. Then, so that they would knowledge about how to prevent this in their everyday living, in their everyday activities, could mm-hmm. continue to live an active life. Mm-hmm. That part. And you think that to bring uh, an occupational perspective in this kind of study is, uh, is uh, really something that can legitimate uh, the role of occupational therapist in this group intervention? So yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Because I think we have the knowledge about uh, what, in some way, uh, what is a fundamental part of, of, of a good life, mm-hmm. and, and that is the, the presence or absence of still the same thing about engaging occupation mm-hmm. in, in a person's life. And if you get this frail and maybe afraid of, of doing things, maybe you avoid to go out, mm-hmm. you avoid to do a number of things, and with knowledge you actually can continue to live an active life. Mm-hmm. And you you have to take some, some um, precautions and, and uh, uh, things like that. But you definitely can continue to do the things you value and like. Mm-hmm. Uh, with some knowledge around this. It's like, um, if I understand, uh, so something is like a uh, research in uh, research with an occupational perspective can support the development of clinical application, and the bridges between practice and research sometimes are not easy to do. It's uh, mm. critics we have a lot uh, when you are working research from the uh, clinician is. Theory and practice is not the same, and it's not easy to see the bridges between them. And mm. you think is that is something? It is maybe more, uh, maybe easier to do if we keep an occupational perspective. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I think we we one of our problem is that we haven't had. I mean, I'm continue going back to this about what Elizabeth Jarks has said that occupational mm. therapy is an applied science in search of a science to apply. We need a theoretical foundation, we need theoretical concept to be able to formulate the unique perspective that we mm-hmm. actually have. If we don't have that language, if we don't have that concept, um, if we're not uh, able to, to uh, ex- explain this as a unique perspective and ground it in scientific research, we don't have anything on the health arena to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, then people can say you're not useful you don't have evidence for what you're doing mm-hmm. we have cost pressure cost mm-hmm. effectiveness of, of us if you don't have any proof of, of what you're actually doing is useful for people you don't have anything mm-hmm. there to do so it's a question of in in basically about mm-hmm. our, the survival of, of mm-hmm. our profession you know, in, in that part in, in many ways. So I think it is extremely important and we have to change the view of our clinicians. I mean, if you go for a surgery and the surgical doctor say, I went out in the program for 15 years ago I don't have any clue about the latest research or or methods that are within my field. I learn some techniques or something like that. And then I continue to practice this. I've heard that there are new uh, research, new evidence and things like that, but it doesn't interest me, you know. I I just continue to work with my operations. Then at least I would say, Interesting to hear. Thank you. <laughs> I think I will go to another hospital <laughs> in, in that part. Mm-hmm. And the same is with us for occupational therapists. I mean, mm-hmm. there is no way outside the scientific way and to work evidence-based and, mm-hmm. and uh, all these things within our profession. I think that that's... 
the thing. And then we should definitely respect uh, the clinical uh, knowledge that, mm -hmm. that so many people ha have in the clinical field. But it is important to raise this knowledge to a more general level and to systematize it in, in a scientific way to be able to, to uh, actually uh, uh, do this. And, and when I, I've done so many courses uh, for clinical occupational therapists that don't, uh, I mean, around this about theories in, in occupational therapy mm -hmm. and theories in occupational science. And I would say with the broad experience they have, it's very easy for them to connect the theoretical concept to this and, and suddenly then they have a language. Mm -hmm. They have a language to argue, mm -hmm. to explain in that part and that's what, what theories and, and concept are for, you know, to, to give, this common language. give a language. Yeah, to give mm -hmm. a common, both have a common language of course within our profession but also mm -hmm. within the communication to, mm -hmm. to uh, those things. and. I think it, it is important uh, to re really say this, that, that this, the, the, the culture has to change within our profession. And I can see, I mean, I've been with this field now for so many years that I can see how it actually has changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, in my own country, how, how it changed uh, uh, to really have have uh, interest in, in that and, and it's so interesting I mean I lecture in occupational science for an hospital one of the biggest hospital here in Stockholm after that they actually uh, the occupational therapist uh, had a, a study group to really go into the concept of occupational science and to discuss within themselves then how can this then be applied to, to our clinical practice? So, so that's, uh, that's where I see my role in, in some way. Uh, I respect the clinicians and how they really work with the patients and, and how they can adapt and, and are sensible to that. They are expert on, on this, but uh, they need also to have this type of language mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and uh, things to be able to deal with with uh, how with their knowledge in mm -hmm. that part. Yeah, right. It's within the first uh, semester actually mm -hmm. uh, for the bachelor program, mm -hmm. um, and this is for me this is very funny because uh, then. The student comes to the first semester and we give them different kind of tasks uh, mm -hmm. uh, to do this and to actually uh, to analyze one occupation, for example, and, uh, and they also will practice occupation mm -hmm. by themselves. And when I come in in the end of the first semester, I first of all talk about the ideas that have guided occupational therapy through the history mm -hmm. and how different paradigms have actually guided occupational therapy from the original paradigm of occupation uh, to a more functional approach and now maybe back to a more occupational mm -hmm. focus in, in that part. And it's very easy also for the students when they come into clinical practice to see that the occupational therapists they meet they might have different views mm -hmm. they of course uh, reflect this different kind of approaches and paradigms that that occupational therapists have had mm -hmm. maybe not really the old type of paradigm, but if you look at the more functional approach mm -hmm. in relation to a more occupational mm -hmm. approach uh, within uh, the clinical practice, this is definitely a reality that, that those students meet. Mm -hmm. And then they could relate this to the different kind of ideas that, that, um, that occupational therapy has developed mm -hmm. in, in that part, you know. They don't meet they're not only meeting the perfect occupational therapist that is the 100% role model, 
people are different and within the different areas of, of health care mm -hmm. this also reflects the different ideas that, that uh, guide occupational therapy and mm -hmm. that part. So that is something which uh, is also I do as a first thing. The mm -hmm. other thing is that we discussed the different kind of, of important aspect mm -hmm. that occupational science then could bring. So we bring in the concept of occupational balance, we bring in the concept of occupational identity, we bring in occupational justice, looking at it from a more uh, societal point of view, and then we're trying to, to mirror that this is also a part of the professional knowledge mm -hmm. that they are, are supposed to learn during these mm -hmm. three years. So I think that that's sort of an important part to bring in, in uh, already in the beginning mm -hmm. of, of the program. And for my students, they think of occupational science as something extremely natural within occupational therapy. Okay. It's not superficial, it's mm -hmm. not problem. I mean, if we are training if clinical psychologists are trained, mm -hmm. don't they need to know general, specific psychological mechanism of the human mm -hmm. being that affects all people in, in that part? Of course they mm -hmm. need to know mm -hmm. that. Uh, expert on heart and heart surgery and heart diseases doesn't that expert need to know how a normal mm -hmm. heart functions? Of course. A professional occupational therapist, doesn't he or she have to know how people in general work, how it works with occupation in general, and how occupation can promote health and development as well as ill health and regression? Mm -hmm. Of course, there's no different for, for our profession as it is for exactly. physicians, as it is for psychologists, as it is for physical therapists, uh, or, or anything uh, else like that. It is the same, and we have an occupational perspective, which is then the specific mm -hmm. perspective that we have. Uh, and that differs then maybe from a psychologist who have a psychological mm -hmm. perspective or a physicians that have a more biomedical perspective. All perspectives are needed or are complementary to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, no one is actually better than the other, but all is needed and all mirrors uh, significant aspects of the human being in, in that part. So, so that's where I want, want to be. And my vision, when I say something about vision for the future, would be that it's very natural for occupational therapy students to read psychology as a part mm -hmm. of their training. It would be as natural for psychological student to read occupational science as part of their development. Mm -hmm. That's my vision of how to establish occupational science as a basic academic discipline and also as a basic perspective, mm -hmm. relevant perspective of the human being. In Not the, only for part. occupational therapies, but in a broader perspective. In a broader perspective, but also for therapy. I mean, if, yeah. if we think about an occupational perspective as something relevant, perspective mm -hmm. of a human being. An occupational therapist is the one that has this knowledge, mm -hmm. included applied knowledge how to do this in, in, in therapy in, in that part. Mm -hmm. And that refers back to my early days as working as clinical occupational therapist, because sometimes I work in psychosocial rehabilitation, and I had a good working alliance with, with the psychologists. Mm -hmm. But because he, it was a he, he could come down to me and say, 
could you have this client in, in, in therapy, occupational therapy? Because I've tried to do some, some talking with him, psychotherapy, but it doesn't seem to, to work, you know. So maybe you can try to try mm -hmm. to do something with him and, and see if that mm -hmm. could, could make him to development. And the same, I, I could do the same. When I had a client, I tried to work with him or, or her in occupational therapy. It didn't work that well. Then maybe I could say to the psychologist, maybe you could try, try to, to go uh, take a, this person into psychotherapy. So, so that's how I view, you know, the thing. And, and that's why I think our, our perspective is so important to establish also as an academic discipline. Mm -hmm. And so you are in education, in OT education, you are teaching about the concept, about basic knowledge in occupational sciences. And is it a, a practical module? Or some practical application? Uh, no, it's a very theoretical module, mm -hmm. actually. Uh, but they they have their practice. They have this practice about their own uh, doing their own occupation. In so they have been choosing a new occupation mm -hmm. as as a part of their very early uh, when they went into the program, mm -hmm. and we could take this uh, early experience to look at, okay, how does this work in, in relation to occupational identity? Mm -hmm. How does this work in relation to occupational balance? How does this work in relation to to other aspects of, of uh, occupation, you know? So from their experience, it's interesting to see how they uh, can relate this to theoretical concept. Mm -hmm. Do they consider the occupation issues as some engaging occupation, mm -hmm. or was it something that they more or less were forced to do by, by the school, and then it sort of faded out mm -hmm. when they didn't uh, uh, had to do it mm -hmm. any longer because it wasn't in their value and, and mm -hmm. interest really. It was ex nice to, to try it on for a while, you know. They can and, reflect uh, on their own experience. They can reflect on their own mm. experience, yeah, definitely. And some of them, for some of them, it was a starting point for something that they still, mm. that they continue. And then they could, yeah. could you know, uh, see how this developed and, and how it possibly, because maybe that's too early if, you know, if you know, they have practice for... for like two or three months yes, that it would be short. a part of their identity, mm -hmm. for example. But maybe in the long run, after a couple of years, and they practiced and continue to practice this, it would be a part of their occupational mm -hmm. identity and, and uh, uh, seeing, seeing them as, as a performer of this mm -hmm. and uh, identifying themselves as, as someone who whatever they do, paint or, or mm -hmm. uh, write uh, articles or uh, something like that. So about leadership? Well, uh, I mean, I don't consider myself as a leader in occupational therapy. I mean, that's for other ones to, to decide. I do my thing so to say. Uh, I'm passionate about uh, theories and, and concepts mm -hmm. and to be able to understand human occupation from, from a scientific perspective mm -hmm. and try to understand and also be a part of the development of concepts that, you know, that makes our understanding better mm -hmm. uh, within human occupations. and, and um, I always say, and when I, I did my seminar as as professor in in Denmark, uh, going into to that position as a professor in Denmark, uh, I said that my I stand on shoulders of uh, very important people. Mm -hmm. I mean, like first of all, that is actually my mentor and role mm -hmm. model in occupational therapy, Gary Kielhofner. He is, was a very important leader and, and still are in some <laughs> way uh, with the power of, of the model of human occupation that is, has been developed. Also Elizabeth Jarksa I also consider uh, as one of my uh, 
inspirators in, in that part. So if I, if I could inspire other people with my writing and, mm -hmm. and uh, lecturing, which I do, and, and things like that, I'm very mm -hmm. happy for that. But when I, if I think about leadership, I think about maybe to advertise uh, ideas. I see myself as a, you know, seller of ideas or mm -hmm. whatever you can call it. I'm, I'm a businessman of <laughs> ideas. That, that's what I, I am. And I want to, to uh, enhance this oh. occupational perspective uh, and be able to, to, to do that. So, uh -huh. I mean, who are, I mean, leader in, in occupational therapy. I mean, there are many leaders in occupational therapy, of course, and uh, yeah, my, my thinking, if I, if I do something good for other people, if I spread ideas mm. about occupation and mm. important concept of occupation, that that's that's okay. <laughs> and you think so? If you want to spread this knowledge or to spread your ideas, you have to do it differently. If you are with clinicians, with researchers, with students, or is it something very similar? Finally, the very, leadership. Very, very, I don't see any really mm -hmm. contradictions in that. Of course, when I'm discussing with with fellow researchers. I have a little bit other approach than, of course. I mean, we have a common knowledge together that, that we don't, if, if I do it with students, I mean, then it's, it's another thing, of course, uh, in, in that part. But it's not that different uh, mm -hmm. in that part. And if I do it with clinicians or if I do some keynote at an occupational therapy congress or, or things like that, uh, I basically talk about the same ideas, but in, in mm -hmm. packed in, in a little bit different ways, of course, in, in that part. Yes, I, I do that, but it's basically the same ideas mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm talking about. Of course, we need leaders in uh, our field, I mean, as within other, all other fields. I mean, uh, it's important to have people that, that take leadership, mm -hmm. I mean, both from an organizational point of view, but which is then my, my passions about, about mm -hmm. the development of concept and, and ideas in, in that part. So I think that that's what we need. We also need, which is maybe something that bothers me a little bit we also need to have a critical view of uh, the ideas and theories that, that we are uh, developing in that way so that sort of we can also have a discussion and debate every academic net discipline needs mm -hmm. this you know uh, so we can't just be united as one because a living debate is something that, that makes mm -hmm. the discipline uh, develop, mm -hmm. I think, in, in that part. But leadership is, of course, very important, but leadership in an academic field has to be earned, not mm -hmm. sort of <laughs> decided from, from the top. I mean, you have to, to earn it with mm -hmm. with, uh, with uh, being able to formulate ideas, being able to formulate uh, ways forward mm -hmm. and uh, things like that.